Hey everybody, welcome to the online edition of Physics 206. We're gonna start off with chapter 29, which is about magnetic fields and magnets and all that good stuff. Uh, just wanted to show my face before I switch to sharing a bunch of PowerPoint slides. Talk to you in a second. Okay, so on to the lovely PowerPoints, which you guys know is not my preferred way of teaching. Um, just wanted to go through real quick that I am going to be breaking up this chapter. So here on the left hand side is all the stuff that is in your book. So those are the different sections in your book. And looking at my notes, my notes for this section of content is organized a little differently. Um, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overview before we really get started. Um, I will not be going through all six of those sections in one shot. We'll break this up so nobody gets too deadly bored. Um, but you can really easily match my notes to the different sections in the book. Um, and I'll try to point it out as we go along. So I really want to start out with talking about permanent magnets. And then we'll talk about um, some of the other things in your book. Okay, so a permanent magnet, you guys might know you can have like a bar magnet. Um, bar magnets tend to have north and south ends, but even your refrigerator magnet that doesn't look like this pretty picture of a bar magnet has a north and south pole. So if you go down to your kitchen, peel a couple of magnets off your refrigerator and try to stick them together, you may notice that some don't wanna stick together. So like we saw with our electric charges, there are things that repel and things that attract. And like we saw with our electric charges, like things repel. So if we try to stick two north ends together, we will feel this force that you see with these red arrows that is repulsive. If we try to stick two south ends together, we will also feel a repulsive force. But if we find a south end and a north end and try to stick them together, we will feel an attractive force and you will see those guys snap together. Great refrigerator experiment that toddlers do across the country, right? The other thing that's interesting about permanent magnets or anything that creates a magnetic field in general is that you are always going to have a north and south end together. So we call this north and south end that occur together a dipole in that there are two poles, right? So if you were to take one of those long bar magnets that you might find and you were to break it in half, you would still have a north and south end. So where you broke it in half, that just becomes a north and a south. And you'll see that sometimes if you like shatter a magnet, you can kind of stick it back together with that attractive force. Um, sometimes dropping a magnet and shattering it will actually demagnetize it. So you can shock something with a physical shock and de-align the magnets. Um, that's a whole other thing. Um, so if you take those smaller magnets and break them again, still you will have a north and south pole. So there has never been found uh, an isolated magnetic pole. There has never been a magnetic monopole found um, in any kind of experiment. So the assumption we go on right now until somebody finds one by itself is that they always occur in pairs. Now, if one is found, we're gonna have to rewrite some physics equations, but that's okay. That's kind of the fun of science that it changes as we go, right? So right now we're going on the assumption North Poles and South Poles always occur together. We're gonna to call them dipoles, right? Okay, so uh, our magnetic fields then are imaginary fields, not imaginary because they actually do things, but invisible fields around our permanent magnets or around anything that can create a magnetic field. Electric currents can actually cause magnetic fields, which is where we're headed in this chapter. Um, but magnetic fields, just like electric fields, we're gonna have to define some things. We're gonna have to define things like, what is the direction of the magnetic field? Um, the direction of the magnetic field, we define as the direction that the north pole of a compass needle would point if placed at that point in space. So you can see right here, 
there are a bunch of little compasses placed outside of this bar magnet. There are actually also iron filings. So iron filings are something that is ferromagnetic. So ferro means iron. Um, ferromagnetic things could also include things like nickel and cobalt. Um, these are just items that have interesting um, or strong magnetic properties. So strong magnetic properties for things that are ferromagnetic. So our compass there is actually a tiny little magnet itself. Um, so it feels a force in this magnetic field. You can think of it as like a test charge in the magnetic sense. It feels a force in this field and realigns itself to sit along the magnetic field lines, right? And so we can use that compass needle to draw this field line that looks like this. So this says out from the North Pole and into the South Pole. Oddly enough, our North Pole of bar magnets is usually denoted with red and our South Pole is usually denoted with blue. So we would draw the arrow of our field line in this direction. Now magnetic field lines are not necessarily just terminating and originating on these two points. We also think of them as continuing through the material of the magnet. And so we think of our magnetic field lines as loops, okay? So loops of field lines because those two poles are always together, right? Um, unlike our electric field lines that just terminate and originate on two different things. So originating on the north end of our magnet out there in space, terminating on the south end. Okay, so we have a couple rules for magnetic field lines, just like we had rules for our electric field lines. The first rule has to do with the direction. So the direction of our magnetic field line, or of our magnetic field is tangent to the line at any point. So if I look at, say, that point right there, tangent to that magnetic field line is this direction. So I'm saying the magnetic field is in that direction at that point. But if I go over here to the left and look at this point, I'm saying the magnetic field points in that direction at that point, right? So this is just like the electric field. Our lines don't cross because if they did, that would give us misinformation, right? It would tell us that the field points in two different directions at the same place. And that makes no sense. So the direction of the magnetic field is tangent to the line at any point where we're trying to measure the magnetic field. Okay, our second thing um, is that the density of the lines, the number per area, is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So if I look down here very close to my North Pole, the density of lines is pretty great, right? And so I expect my field strength to be pretty high in comparison to looking at that same area out here where if I extrapolate this, my density of field lines is not as great. So the density of lines, the number per area is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Still similar to our electric field line rules. All right, one place we see a lot about our magnetic, or about magnetic fields is just talking about Earth's magnetic field. So when you talk about Earth's magnetic field, there are usually a couple things you talk about. Um, the magnetic north of Earth is not the same as the pole of our rotation. So we've got a rotational axis, and then we've got a magnetic pole. Um, it's believed that the Earth's magnetic field is created by ions of nickel and iron um, that are fluid in the Earth's interior and in motion. And so those currents kind of create um, an electric current, which creates a magnetic field, right? Okay, so two things you talk about with Earth's magnetic field are magnetic declination, which just means the angular difference between the magnetic pole and the true pole or the rotational axis. Um, and that's lo location dependent. So basically that's saying your compass is pointing to a slightly different place than what you would call the North Pole of rotation. Um, that is location dependent in the US. It varies from zero to 20 degrees, 
Um, so depending on where you are in the US, you might wanna check out your map and make sure your declination you're factoring in. Um, the other thing is the angle of dip. So if you ever look at a compass, you might see that it dips down and touches um, the compass when you think you're holding it level. Um, the angle of dip is just the angle that Earth's magnetic field makes with the horizontal, right? So if I look at my little cartoon on the right-hand side, this um, area where the field is kind of pointing into the Earth is not going to be um, parallel with the horizontal ground, right? All right, and here's just an image of the declination for a certain area um, on this uh, topographical map of the US. So you would know that you would point your compass at the 15 degrees off of true north here. That's what this is showing you. Um, and then you walk north in the direction, if you're walking north, um, then you're actually pointing in the direction of true north. So in your textbook, there is a section like this, instead of trying to write it all out by hand, um, I decided to type it all up for you guys. Um, so like I said, there are gonna be similarities and differences to how we talked about electric field and electric force and how we talk about magnetic field and magnetic force. So typically magnetic field is denoted by the letter B and it is a vector, just like the electric field with the letter E was a vector. Um, you can measure the existence of the magnetic field from measuring the magnetic force on a test particle. So with electric forces, we um, could say that the electric force was proportional to the charge of our particle. With magnetic forces, that is the same. So the magnetic force is gonna be proportional to the charge Q of the particle. The other thing we're gonna see is that the magnetic force on a negative charge is directed in the opposite direction as the force on a positive charge moving in the same direction. So if we release a proton and an electron um, in the same direction and put them in a magnetic field, they're gonna go in different directions and opposite directions because they're gonna feel opposite forces. Um, and then the magnetic force is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field vector. So the stronger magnetic field we're in, the stronger the force our test particle is going to feel. Now the difference is to electric forces. To feel a magnetic force, our test particle, our test charge, has to be in motion. So the magnetic force on our test particle is going to be proportional to the speed of the particle. So I'll say that again, to feel a magnetic force, our charged particle needs to be in motion. If the velocity vector makes an angle with the magnetic field, the magnitude of the magnetic force is gonna be proportional to sine of that angle. Where this is getting us to is that we're gonna to have to do a cross product to understand what force we're gonna feel. So when a charged particle moves parallel to the magnetic field vector, the magnetic force on the charge is zero. So we can have a moving charge in a magnetic field and it can still feel zero force if sine theta is zero. Then the other thing is when a charged particle moves in a direction that's not parallel to the magnetic field vector, the magnetic force acts in a direction that is perpendicular to both our velocity and our magnetic field. That is, the magnetic force is perpendicular to the plane that's formed by our velocity and our magnetic field. This is where we need a right-hand rule. And I will explain this more to come. So we need a right-hand rule. We're gonna do a cross product to get that perpendicular relationship between those three vectors. All right, that is a good place to pause. We'll pick up here with the uniform magnetic field for the next video.